everyone. Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and today we have another interview in our denominational series, and this time I'm joined by my friend Tom. Tom, hello. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, so we're, we're glad to have you on, but uh, before we get in, we're going to be talking about uh, the Brethren movement and talking about what that is and who you are and what you all are up to, and as people probably heard already, uh, you are not uh, from North America specifically, but uh, you're coming from across the pond, as some people like to say, but Tom, why don't you get us started, just introduce yourself, let people know who you are, and maybe uh, generally speaking, where you are. Cool, yeah, so... Yeah, as you pointed out, I am from Scotland. So I come from a rural village, southwest Scotland, um, 21. And I recently graduated from the University of Glasgow with a history degree and currently unemployed because of COVID. That's my excuse, not the fact I've got a history degree or an arts degree. And, you know, I'm pushing the, the COVID narrative. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been in gospel halls all my, all my life. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. And uh, as someone with a, another uh, history degree here, I can totally relate to that. And you know what, COVID, uh, for historical minded people, COVID hasn't been the worst thing. It's given us a lot more time, I would say, at home to get reading done. And we have, I think, a good excuse to be uh, in the book. So Tom, so glad you could be on and look forward to diving in here. But I think before we get into uh, the nitty gritty. We just need to get some terms out of the way. I know people here, uh, you mentioned the gospel halls and uh, the brethren, that, that's something of name people might be familiar with, like gospel, people know gospel, people know the term brethren, but we're using it here with you in a specific way. So why don't you just let us know about your faith tradition? Sure. Yeah. So where's it start? I suppose it would start with sort of the Plymouth brethren, um, which came about in the 1820s with people like John Nelson Darby mm -hmm. and like-minded people who, you know, they were, didn't consider themselves to be a denomination. Um, they seen the denominationalism of Ireland, of Scotland and of England, and more and more tradition of man um, being placed above scripture. Right. So there was a movement to just get back to New Testament. And I know it sounds very controversial because I, I think every Christian, every person in the denomination believes that they're based on the Bible. Right. Um, but yeah, just getting back to New Testament truth and not like teachings of men which have gone on for centuries, you know, getting back to... Um, so we're like, the history, there's Plymouth Brethren, and then it sort of splits over how exclusive it is, I think, in the mid-1800s with people like George Miller mm. and Robert Chapman. Um, they break away into the Open Brethren. Uh, so you've got exclusive brethren, sort of the Darbyites and people like that continue that tradition. So I'm not that. We're Open Brethren. Right. And then that goes even further into... You know, there'll people be go to gospel chapels or gospel halls or um, Christian fellowships. So they have some tag, and it doesn't really mean anything apart from gospel halls are slightly more conservative um, than gospel chapels. So, in terms of strictness, in terms of how how we enforce discipline or what's expected of a believer, or someone in fellowship. So yeah, mm. um, but open brethren should always be ready to extend the right hand of fellowship. We are always include, you know, we invite people in to even just observe. Um, there's no secrets. There's no hidden formula in here. Um, but when people come in, there is an expectation that they conform to assembly truths. You know, we, we can any denomination can come in, but you know, they have to conform to God's word as we interpret it. Um, right. Hmm. Yeah. yeah so, so that, that mm -hmm. that's very good. And maybe we'll just pause right there before I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you, but I want to just hit on a couple things you said there so that people don't lose track. People might not have picked up on some of those names you mentioned, but you mentioned 
uh, Darby and Mueller. And uh, for those even here, Canada, if you're a Baptist, those might be names you heard of where Darby, of course, uh, well, I say, of course, if you're familiar with dispensationalism, which is a major thought here and very, I would say, in Baptist circles, a dominant stream of uh, approaching the Bible for the past 50, 70 years going on that, at least in my area, Darby is the, I would say, the grandfather of that movement. So already we know that the brethren associated with Darby, intense passion for and a reliance upon scripture, whether we agree with it or not, you're scripture people. And then of course, Mueller, I think he's someone that people, if you're into reading Christian biographies, you've probably seen a George Mueller biography with his orphanages and just his passion for God's word. And I think he was the one that they would say, uh, when he wake up, he would uh, get on his knees first thing before his feet touch the floor, be his knees and he'd pray for two, three hours, something like that. So uh, a, a pious people in the best of senses. So just want to make sure people heard those names, recognize those names. And you got a bit into uh, the different groups there. And that's where I, I wanted to just pause and uh, make sure people heard that there are different groups, the Plymouth Brethren, people might be familiar with the name. Then you mentioned Exclusive Brethren, and then Open Brethren. And that's your group. And within that, you have Gospel Chapels, Gospel Halls, Christian Fellowship. So you said the names don't uh, mean anything apart from separating one another, but may, maybe just you're, you're in a gospel hall. When you say that term, it, is that a reference to a, a building or is that uh, the congregation as an organization? What, what exactly does that mean? Yeah. So as brethren, um, which is very difficult because brethrenism is based on, we don't have a denom denomination and we don't have tags. Right. So you'll see a lot when you read brethren books or articles and whatnot will say so-called brethren mm -hmm. so-called open brethren and um, so gospel hall will be mainly the building it will reference the building essentially okay um, so it'll usually have like the name of the place so such and such main street gospel hall or xy village you know gospel hall like um, mm. or some biblical name like hebron or bethesda or something gospel hall um and gospel hall it, there's sort of a spectrum between um you put it put it this way um gospel halls are your more tie suits and tie wearing um take not less to do with the world um, right. in my opinion mm -hmm. and then there's sort of a wee spectrum over to gospel chapels you know you'll not get hung out to dry if you wear a polo shirt to the, uh -huh the meeting you know um not that you live in the gospel but you know <laughs> that's kind of the spectrum right um, right yeah okay so and and that of course that exists i won't say in other denominations since that that's a sticky term here but in other christian groups and parts of the world even in my baptist world people know certain streams of baptist you're you're more suit and tie you won't get beat up for wearing a polo, but you kind of don't do that here. And that does speak to, I guess, a more general way of doing things. What you wear says something about maybe your your spirituality as a whole. And, and we're, we're not trying to say, oh, if you're wearing a suit and tie, you're serious. But stuff like that typically yeah. goes on. People know that. So no no, uh, no yeah. shame in that. But uh, yeah. just uh, thinking a bit more about then, before we get into, I'm sure people want to hear what goes on in the gospel hall and what goes on. Uh, among the people so-called brethren and I, I'll pause there and say that that's kind of like when we speak of uh, like the artist formerly known as such and such they don't have a name anymore where I, I think that's the difficulty with a movement like that saying we're pulling away from denominations but everyone else looking in would probably say oh well you just yeah. become your own denomination and of course that's a tricky thing to to travel and maybe we'll get to that in a moment but as we think more about who uh, your I guess in my world, we would say your church family or your your broader community, who you are and what you believe. Uh, why don't you just give us a sense of, you mentioned pulling away from the traditions of man. That was a big part of it and that history, but maybe just help people out. What are these things that you are either pulling away from as a movement and moving towards? What what are the, I guess, the key doctrines or spiritual practices? What What goes on there? Yeah, so... Good question. So we pull away from, so every gospel hall will be autonomous. Mm -hmm. It will be ruled by elders and the assembly there, everyone in fellowship, right. um, which we 
we see in scripture, you know, Paul writes to individual churches, mm. he, he writes to assemblies and they, they can gather. There's nothing, you know, it's not like a synod or something like we see it as a church, a local church acts right. as a body. Um, but it's part of a universal church, obviously, of all Christians, which mm. is not limited to brethren movements or it's just getting back to scripture and elevating scripture so we don't have creeds we don't have confessions and mm. um, i know a lot of people in gospel will be very much against those um historically they're very useful i can see why people like i suppose that's a sense what we do we understand why people do things so um ecclesiology or how you order a church like presbyterianism or anglicanism we understand why right but we don't see it in scripture you know god orders his house mm. you know if, if you have a house if you own a house you don't want someone coming in saying i'll move the sofas around or i'll no this kitchen it's not gonna be a bed you know god orders his house right. alone and we don't have a secular power mm. ordering the house we don't have a higher authority ordering the house um we have some hierarchy obviously so we have what you describe as members or people in fellowship mm. um, and then you'd have depending on the size we are quite a small assembly and um, sort of 20 in fellowship mm. so we don't have deacons but we'll have like elders right um, so for larger churches deacons will help but if you're if you're only 20 you don't need huge you know offices or office bearers um, mm. yeah so the key thing just autonomy and just basic simple things simple simple lord's supper simple baptism simple uh, meetings you know there's no special robes there's no special liturgy there's no special smells and bells there's just even gospel halls and we don't place any emphasis in the building I mean, you can tell a gospel hall, I think. If you know gospel hall, you can tell a gospel hall because it's just a very modest, plain-looking building uh, with a couple of windows. Um, and you go in and there's no crosses, there's no tapestries, there's no uh, images. Everything is geared towards God and mm. worshipping God. You don't distract. Like, if God wants to be worshipped in spirit, we don't need golden candlesticks and things, you know. That's right. what we believe. Um, just very plain and everything is orderly, mm. God's order and yeah, simplicity. Which right. which you know, I may I may sound contradictory as I say simplicity and then we'll make go deeper in the conversation, I'm like doesn't sound very simple, all these, you know, all this and that. But yeah, as Christianity goes, simplicity as is put out in the Bible, rather than church teachings and confessions and right and things like that yeah and I, I could say for myself and I'm sure a lot of people listening at least in my circles evangelical baptist they're probably nodding along saying that that sounds exactly right praise god we're on the same page here and of course I, I think there are some parallels between uh the origins of I guess this brethren sort of return to scripture and the baptist uh reform coming out of both uh, this heavily Anglican setting, and of course, not a knock against Anglicans, but that something they really hold up. And I think they would acknowledge, uh, I think uh, Jacob last time who was on acknowledged that Anglicans prize this structure, this ecclesiology, where the whole thing that sets Ang Anglicanism apart, its feature is rule by bishops. And I think we would agree, we'd look at the scripture and wondering where, where are these higher courts? Where is the state church apparatus and all these sort of, uh, of course, when it comes to canon law in certain circles, we, I think we would agree, we'd look at that and go, yeah, that that's not the, the spirit of the New Testament. And of course, we can understand. I'm glad you said that. I'm finding myself appreciating your language here. We can understand why people do those things, but we'd also go, I, I get why you're doing that, but why? So it's kind of yeah. a, a I mean, if you're, if, you're a, if you're the state religion or okay. if you're the most dominant religion, you can understand why there's huge gatherings, and, you know, mm. everything set out. It makes sense, right? From right. an earthly point of view, of course, yeah, everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet. But then is that really as directed 
description of like what we're seeing. Yeah. Right, right. And I think that's a, a key point there that I think, again, both of us would share. And you, you mentioned autonomy. And that, of course, is a Baptist distinctive as well, where God orders his house and he's building his house. And we want to live in that house, but we're, we're not going to take over. And of course, not trying to knock anyone else here, but that that's something I think we would both approach and we would hold up. But uh, just maybe stepping back a bit, uh, just a couple more questions before we move on into life in uh, a gospel hall. But uh, so you mentioned you have elders and of course, with a, a small group, you wouldn't require deacons to do that extra work. And I think that's very much a Baptist approach as well. There are two offices, we would say offices of the church and typically deacons are recognized. It's if the elders need some help. So I think that might be a similar thought process, but I know uh, just the way we use terms and the realities of different movements, Baptists and brethren, we aren't the same. We might share many things. And I think one of those things might be, and maybe we'll tease that out a little bit here, is how we approach the things we do have in its simplicity. And maybe you might be, you might be thinking, oh, Baptist, he, Christian's saying we agree on a lot, but he's still like those people with all those extra stuff. And my church does have a statement of faith, which would be a similar thing to a creed. I don't know if you would have something analogous yeah, we, to that some do some don't that's, okay. that's the most confusing part you've got someone who's from x gospel hall right. where you could find someone from y gospel hall and you're like hold on did x say that no we don't do that because it's just autonomous you know right you're saying you're based on scripture mm. and you're not you're not set by a standard of rules you will get some liberty there you will get some differences right so yeah so our our hall our assembly so like we we don't say I, I do find it funny the Derby translation has zero instances of the word church um, it's a very brethren thing everything is assembly and assembly testimony and assembly truth so like our assembly not that we stick to that I can say church and not be burnt at this state you know mm. um but yeah we slight differences um I just lost the train of thought but yeah yeah. Back to what so, you're going on. so so maybe maybe I'll tease that out a bit more, but that already gives us something there where uh, I, I think in your tradition or in your world, things just speaking of the church might be some questions there we want to use. So ecclesia typically is translated assembly when people are doing a raw translation so that you'd be again trying to stick to the bi biblical language as you see it as closely as possible. Baptist will say church is a valid translation, but from that position, we would have a strong emphasis upon the government of the local church. So we would share elders, but as I understand it, and maybe this is a learning time for me as well, in the Baptist world, we would take the ordination of elders quite seriously. So when I was ordained an elder, there was a, a vote and there was a official time where I wasn't an elder. I became an elder. As you can see here, elder is an office. I'm not an old man who's an elder in an age sense, but to me, at least in my limited studies into the brethren world, it would seem a lot more organic as you would approach those titles and how they play out. There wouldn't be a hard distinction. So maybe you could tell us a bit, what, what would it mean to be an elder in a, a gospel hall? Like, how does that happen? Yeah. So as far as I understand it, because I'm not an elder. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't think you can, you have to be an old person to be an elder. Like you say, it's just, I'm not an elder. Right. Um, so I think as far as I am aware, the office of the elder isn't, you know, some big vote or decision. And I don't I don't think we're asked, you're not asked to be an elder. Um, a lot of things in the gospel hall, you just fulfill the duties. And so an elder will be doing the duties of an elder before they're an elder. Mm, okay. um, obviously not high up decision making or discipline, but you know speaking or teaching and um, looking out for uh, other people in the assembly if they're older they're looking out for the younger and um, things like that they will already be doing a lot of the work of an elder and it's more yeah like you say it's organic and um, they sort of just take on that role um, as god leads them um, so yeah okay. there's no vote and there's no oh, by the way, brother, you know, nudge, nudge, can you, can you be an elder? Um, but yeah, we do believe in a plurality of elders. Right. Hmm. And they will affect, like the qualifications are in the Bible. I'm sure we know, we don't need to go to like First Timothy right. or 
find the qualification of an elder, but you almost fulfill those qualifications before you then just naturally progress into an elder. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, just to point out, um, elders, you know who the elders are, but even if there were a list of, even if there were deacons, we don't have like a set order, you know, like you walk into some places and it's like the, you know, church family or meet the, we'll just, it should be obvious who the elders are. Um, but deacons are just helpers. They're not any, you know, they don't have epaulets on or, either, you know, right. no special rank. Um, again, it, plain as the, as the, the method is the way things go. It's just mm. very simplistic as a scripture should be, as we believe. Yeah. Right. So may, maybe another question from there. I think people can already understand where we might share a lot, but have some different approaches or philosophy of local church governance. Uh, so something I learned in one of my classes a while ago, and maybe this is now I could get some verification. We've spoken a bit about this in the past, but as I understand it, uh, the brethren won't have like people on staff, like a, a lead pastor who is being paid by the church. It's truly more of an organic community. Hey, well, and, and maybe this is a question. I'm not sure if you would be aware of this, but like how, how exactly does a, a gospel hall raise the money to maintain their building? Is that like, is there anyone who's on staff or officially recognized as like, like who, whose name would the building property be under stuff like that? So yeah, if you have and that might be out of your wheelhouse. I'm not sure, but uh, any thought on that? Yeah, so um, a lot of positions like we will have a treasurer, mm. as as one needs to have in modern days. You know, right. you can't if you're working with a bank account, you can't just have. Oh, yes, we're from the assembly. You need a name. Yes, yeah. so someone will voluntarily take on treasurer, uh, okay. or one of the elders, um, will have. You know, they will have ownership of the building or something like that um, yeah but like there will be a collection every week usually and um, some gospel halls will do it during communion as you would call it during the lord's supper right. um or some gospel halls will just have like a box at the back a collection box um and like no one's commanded to put x amount in um, usually, I think the standard is ten percent, as you know, the Old Testament is. I'm sure will be the the standard for a lot of Protestants, for a lot of Christianity. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, like that's how you raise funds, and yeah. And and, uh, and pastors on staff, not a thing. It's just the elders who are. More yeah, definitely. A, okay. Um, so, like pastors. It, it, we see pastors and elders sort of very similar yeah um, also the priesthood of all believers mm -hmm. so if someone has the gift of teaching and the elders can see that they can teach right. as they have the gift of like we have a gospel service a gospel meeting um which will be like half an hour 45 minutes of just gospel from the bible if mm -hmm. someone has that gift someone can do that with the discretion of the elders they can and they won't get a wage for that we don't from scripture we don't see any salaries um but with things like so gospel halls will have or open brethren will have full-time workers as mm. they're called or full-time evangelists um or things words like that basically their employment is evangelism as the name suggests but they're not paid um they're not paid by the gospel hall. they're supported they're commended by the gospel hall so they can receive gifts you know like all would ask for gifts or receive gifts. Um, and that was not like a salary. So a lot of either voluntary or gift in the gospel hall. If, if someone, if, if a brother from another gospel hall travels to speak at our, one of our meetings, um, he might get a gift for a few or get a meal or something, right? Right. Um, but he's not given away, he's not given like a wheat or mm we don't have one person who is in charge of expositing or teaching God's word for the year. Um, it's down to the men in, the in fellowship in the local assembly. Um, usually the elder will organize it, you know, not just like a, a open stage or open mic, you know, there is, there has to be some uh, order. Right. Uh, 
in, in those kind of meetings um, and it gets more complicated yeah and Gotham meetings and ministry meetings bible teaching whatever you want to say yeah there's order but there's no okay brother tom um here's your wage this month or we expect you to you know talk you know your your month is on romans or something you know, or in the next month you know right. um, it's not laid out like that because we don't see salaries from the bible mm. I, again understand why it happens right um we understand and like we don't we don't send people off to a biblical college mm. or divinity schools um which you can do you can I, I know of people in the brethren people in gospel halls who'd go off and get a master's in divinity or which yeah i understand it it would be great to understand greek and hebrew from an academic point of view so we're not not bashing it right just saying you don't have to go through that to be ordained you know we don't have to if god's given you the gift you'll provide the necessary means of money like again george miller um prayed didn't know when the next paycheck was coming in but still managed to get by time and time after again with just relying on god mm. um which i'm not again not giving anyone stick if they're receiving a wage you yeah. are still relying on god just a wee asterisk there but right. yeah we don't get no. is what we do yeah. so so that tom that's very helpful and i i think people heard a lot of things that would probably sound again familiar but uh, it, I think we get a good sense of the direction that's being headed. And I guess, ooh, got a notification. We got, we got some key themes that are going on. So a lot of simplicity is a key theme. Voluntary service seems to be a key theme. And then just w working together with a sense of order, but also not a formal structure like we might have it even in my Baptist world. So, I, and as I'm thinking about Baptist history, it sounds like there would be maybe some influence or a lot of discussion where Baptists from the very beginning, lay preaching, very common and uh, traveling, very common between different groups and the gift and that sort of stuff. So sounding very familiar, but uh, again, yeah, where we I might just jump in. Yeah, um, go ahead. So like, it is very, it is very similar um, because, you know, as God, as you focus on God's truth, you know, it's not in the wall of a denomination, as we believe. But that's a great thing about brethren or gospel halls. If you look at major organizations, a lot of the people just getting, rolling up their sleeves and getting their hands dirty, turn out to be either in the gospel hall or their dad was in the, their family were in the gospel hall. Like mm. Things like operation mobilization or big missionary organizations tend to have a lot of even though they're a bit ecumenical, even though they just they're not like we are the brethren, by the way. Yeah. We tend to be, you know, someone down the line has been in the brethren because mm. they tend to be at least in voluntary service, just like you and I are still Chris. I still view you as a brother in Christ and still have fellowship. Do you know what I mean? It's not, well, you're not conforming to this confession, you're not conforming to these, like if there's gospel to be preached hallelujah will be there you know like right look if there's if there's a village or if there's a town and something's going on um funeral be it you know someone from another denomination mm. or a denomination i'll just call myself out there yeah, right. um <laughs> if there's a baptist say preaching the god we're going support you know go and help because it's the gospel or not like Oh dear, you know, can't be associated with them because we're open brethren. I think that's the difference, you know, isn't it? Right. We focus on what is common in terms of the gospel. And again, you should have mentioned gospel halls are called gospel halls because that is the impetus, that is the very high priority as the gospel. You know? Right. Um mm. and when it comes to things like that, we probably have a lot of common ground, very low church, very um like urgency of the gospel on scripture solo scripture things like that yeah so and, and that might be the perfect segue now where we heard about the the direction and maybe as we move now to talk about what life and worship actually looks like in a gospel hall I, i'm sure we'll tease out a bit more uh the, theological conviction or just direction as we move through that so tom why don't you just uh take us through what would go on during you mentioned there are different names and it sounded like when we were speaking a bit earlier that there were a, a host of different meetings that take place but uh 
So in the Baptist world, we have our Lord's Day service that's corporate worship on a Sunday morning. And that's, it seems like most other movements, traditions, denominations, whatever term we're using here, have that similar sort of uh, worship service on a Sunday morning. Uh, in your gospel hall, I imagine you'd have something similar, your flagship kind of service. So maybe you could walk us through what goes on there, what does it look like, and uh, maybe who's speaking and who's attending. Yeah, great. So I'll try to be not too, going into too many details um, yeah. here a while. But, and again, gospel hall will do things differently. Right. But on a Sunday, I, I went to one gospel hall when I was younger and it would be the morning meeting, like breaking a bread, and then it would be um, prayer meeting and then Sunday school and then like the old folks home and then the ministry meeting. Mm. And then your day would be full of things, right? So I'll try to try to be uh, brief. Like we have what we say the Lord's Supper or the breaking of bread or communion, as it's more commonly known. Right. Um, and that would be a Sunday morning. And those in fellowship would gather, although other people who are not in fellowship may sit and observe. Mm -hmm. Some gospel halls reserve a seat at the back just for people coming in who are not in fellowship but still want to be, you know, present. Right. Um, so what happened there is, as scripture commands us to, let's say, the first day of the week, and we show forth the Lord's death with symbols of bread and wine. So there'd be a mixture of men in fellowship praying or reading scripture or, well, can't do it now with COVID, but like hymn singing mm -hmm. as the spirit leads. There's not numbers up in the back of the church wall or something. Oh. Um, it's very, you know, down to the member, down to the person in fellowship, to what is God's laid upon their heart you know like throughout the week I find and a lot of people find even not in gospel halls but your attitude throughout the week when you sit on a Sunday morning on the pew on the bench on the chair what you've gathered that week is going to be you know dependent on if you're sitting filled with the world Monday to Saturday and you show up and it's like silent around about you and you're just alone your thoughts it's very dependent on whether or not you've been with God, if you've been reading God's word that week. So praying um, with the focus on showing forth the Lord's death. So prayers relating to Christ's death on Calvary and his sacrifice or reading portions of scripture as a spirit lead or as they felt they had to um, reading passages and then, yeah, mixture of hymns, no music on a Sunday morning, no accompanying music, mm. um, which is very dire if your assembly has no one musically minded as mine does. <laughs> but, you know, I always say the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't make don't make a skillful noise or right. a tuneful noise. It's a joyful one. So yeah. we get past that way. Um, mm. So then a brother will give thanks for the bread. Um, and that is broken, it's usually a loaf, and it's passed around. Um, and then immediately after, the brother will give thanks for the cup. It's usually a common cup, and then it's mm. passed around to those in fellowship. Um, which I should say, people who are not part of the fellowship, the local assembly, but visiting, this will depend, um, that's why there is open and closed brethren, and how exclusive you are if you have a closed table. Some people require a letter of commendation to let you take of the emblems to break bread. Others will have like a short interview with elders. Um, you know, if we know the person and we know they've been saved and baptized, they can uh, join in fellowship. Mm. There's that. And then, so that's essentially the Lord's Supper. Right. Which, okay. Which is very simple to me, but if there's any point of that, you're like, oh, it's so peculiar, or why do you do it that way? Yeah, feel free to pick up on any points there. Yeah, so no, that, that makes sense to me. And I think people, again, hearing this can 
I guess, detect some similarities and perhaps some differences, but uh, in the Baptist world as well, in other uh, traditions, an open versus closed communion discussion is a living conversation. So in, in my part of uh, the Baptist corner here in Ontario, open communion is very common where if, if you're a believer and we would uh, give the warning, but, uh, and the elder presiding would say, this is for believers and then people can partake, but, uh, some are a bit more stringent and some are, well, I would say that's, yeah. a, that's about the peak for open, but again, uh, interviews and sometimes a, a letter of commendation for those, uh, in, in our world, at least it would look like if you're visiting from another church or on vacation, you would have a little actual letter or maybe a note from yeah. one of your elders back home to say, Hey, no, it seems to be yeah. like, I remember reading in history and Scotland Presbyterian history you would need that if you moved you would have to have a letter saying this person or me and my family that written from the elder or elders of the church saying here is how I contribute mm. to the local assembly or like please welcome them into fellowship um yeah which is I know of gospel halls which will not let people unless they have that's the only rule they have a letter of commendation or introduction right um i don't know if i would be as strict as that i think you know, you're denying someone what's commanded by scripture based upon a slip of paper when right. you know you, you get into rabbit holes and big discussions here yeah on on the surface yeah but to go deeper yeah um we will only have men speaking Mm. in our assembly and we practice headship which is the doctrine of headship which may, means men have their head uncovered mm. and women will have their heads covered um first corinthians 11 but you know right. order of creation all that it's a whole nother um you can make a video on that at one point you know <laughs> yeah. um yeah so that, that we we have order like we're saying um mm. god's house and even if we don't like that like a lot of people don't these days like um the whole egalitarian complementarianism thing mm -hmm. but it's not about what we like at the end of the day you know like we said god orders his house and he's written precisely how um meetings should be ordered so yeah we base it off of that mm -hmm. and yeah so yeah so maybe I'll, I'll ask a question there. And again, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned it. Those are some big conversations in a lot of churches people are having. So you're sharing your opinion. I'll say it, I say it every interview. This isn't a, an in-depth discussion debate kind of show. And I'm sure we've yeah. uncovered many differences, but uh, a lot of similarities. So I think that's key here, just learning. But as, as you were speaking, you, you mentioned a big part. So it sounds like prayer is a big part of when you gather and breaking bread. And it sounds like, baptism i would presume would happen would that happen during a sunday morning and what, what would a baptism look like in in a gospel yeah. hall so the sunday morning is exclusively for the lord's supper oh, okay and um, the rest of the sunday we you might have a gospel meeting like mentioned earlier mm. you would invite people in from the village or city or wherever and or the local area and they'd hear the sit and hear the gospel right. um or you might have ministry on a sunday we don't we have a ministry meeting on a tuesday which is a brother from the assembly or visiting will just open God's word. And if they're speaking for a number of weeks, they'll go through something or yeah. But mm. yeah, so baptism, we have two sacraments. Again, another similarity probably there. Yeah. Um, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So baptism is a service in and of itself mm. um, or a meeting. And usually, you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek. If brethren, if people from gospel halls can get the gospel in somewhere, they will. You know, at a wedding, you're going to sit through a gospel message at some point, if it's to brethren, or baptism. You'll probably have someone explaining what it is and probably a gospel message because it will be a public thing. Right. Um, like my baptism invited school friends, because I was still at school, invited anyone who wanted to come in um even my friends parents you know because it's public it's a public confession of faith so well, we believe it's a public confession of faith. right um and yeah baptism full immersion 
Mm. Some golf balls will have a tank, and probably most have like a baptismal tank. Right. Um, although if you're very brave and living in Scotland, you can go to a nearby river. <laughs> um, which you'll need to do it in the summer, which I think was a Thursday this year. Right. Um, yeah. So, oh. yeah. Okay. Well, that's what a baptism sort of looks like. Yeah. And as well, baptism is very closely linked with fellowship. Mm, okay. So you couldn't just independently do a baptism, I don't think. You're baptized and added to the company. Right. So or you're added to the fellowship. Mm. Um, you're baptized. And sometimes there's a way, sometimes God calls and says, you know, it's a very serious thing being in fellowship. But I believe you're baptized, you're in fellowship, um, and that's you. You know, you don't need to... Baptism doesn't add anything. It's not, not like a qualification. It is just, as it's put out in Scripture, you don't have to be saved to be baptized. You don't have to be... Um, it doesn't do anything. It's just an outward confession of an inward change. Mm. Um, yeah. But it is necessary. You wouldn't be unbaptized and added to fellowship. Right. Like that again, open and closed tables. How do you define baptism? Um, it's very tricky and it's a lot of minor arguments there. That's another issue. Is a full immersion the only valid baptism? And do we exclude people who are not? Yeah. Um, but essentially that's what our baptism is. Um, and yeah. Okay, that again, so many I can point them all out, but I'll just leave them for the listener. A lot of parallels between your yeah. world and my Baptist world, and it really sounds like uh, so at least as I understand it, there's a group of Baptists called the Primitive Baptists in especially the United States, and primitive not in a, a, a condescending kind of way, but it speaks of, speaks of sort of the old ways of doing like the old paths in a positive sense, I would say, and it sounds like. Yeah. Perhaps there might be a lot of overlap where I think primitive Baptists would be very much as plain Jane as it can get. And just so I, I would imagine they might be uh, if so. I don't know the brother in history and like that part of the United States, like West Virginia or the Appalachian Mountains. But it sounds like they would probably have a lot of a similar philosophy when it comes to language and just the ways of doing things while my Baptist, which is ironic. I, uh, my group of Baptists really descends from Scottish Baptists who came in the 1700s in the Ottawa Valley, but they, they were a bit, maybe a bit more Presbyterian influenced when it came to church order. But uh, Tom, thank you so much for just explaining all that. And you, you mentioned there are so many other meetings and that would be, well, maybe we'll have to do another show just to go through them all, or we can find a resource that talks about it or something along those lines. But as we close it out here, I have a couple more questions uh, uh, for you, and then we'll, we'll get to some concluding thoughts. But the, the first question, maybe this could just be more so a, a speed round kind of thing. So people have heard who the brethren are, got an idea of what they're about, despite the absence of creeds, I would get the sense that you are uh, confessing the Trinity. You mentioned sola scriptura. I'm imagining the solas come along with the uh, sola fide and all those other wonderful ones. So it sounds like in terms of uh, people wondering, it sounds like uh, there would be an evangelical Protestant sort of uh, tent over all of us. So we would share that faith, but uh, uh, people wonder. So I'll ask uh, a classic conversation is uh, Arminianism and Calvinism in my Baptist world. Is that a discussion among the brethren and would they land in one of those camps or something different altogether? So again, some gospel halls take nothing to do with tags. Yeah. Um, and they take nothing to do with anything earthly, particularly mm. in Northern Ireland. I think some people won't even vote in an election oh, because that's too earthly. But yeah, it was a huge discussion. And because there's no set teaching, mm. um, there's you're free. You can be still in fellowship, and um, depending how far you know, if you're going extremely reformed, and to, if if your gospel hall believes in dispensationalism, you wouldn't want someone coming along and teaching covenant theology or right. replacement theology, you know, things like that. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think Darby and the original Brethren movement was very Calvinistic, right. but sort of 1800s, maybe even early 1900s, it becomes more Arminian. Mm. So I think it's a fair split. And I don't think, you know, I wouldn't want to label people. Um, right. Arminian or Calvinist, because I have sat through too many 
discussions in living rooms after a meeting or get invited back to someone's house and you're just sitting there and you're like here we go again it's like the baptism <laughs> debate it's like god's sovereignty and election you're like right i don't think we're going to solve this right now mm. um but you know you sit through them and i i don't think it's a huge primary issue mm. that you wouldn't be cast out of fellowship for saying um i'm an arminian although I think every person who would not be Calvinist in gospel hold would still firmly hold to perseverance of the saints or eternal sure. security. Yeah. Um, very much so. But other things like corporate elections are popular in some places mm-hmm. and things like that. Again, there's no strict setting on it. Um, it just depends what the assembly there teaches. And obviously you don't want to brush people up the wrong way. Um, you don't want to be stepping on toes and be like, if you know a few people in an assembly are Arminian or free, more free will, you know, kind of people, you wouldn't go in, in ministry and be like, yes, you know, reformed is, you know, you just wouldn't, right? There's discretion there. Um, so, yeah, I I fall under more Calvinistic, but again, I wouldn't buy up all of John Calvin's yeah. theology. Um, I don't think you would either, even if you were. You know, there's there's like pedo baptism and things. You know, yeah, yeah. There's things like that. Um, which again, we don't. That would be men's teaching. Mm-hmm. Going further to to down that path, you're like, okay, what does scripture say? Okay, that's fair enough, right? right. You go by scripture rather than such and such commentary or such and such confession. You know, the Westminster Confession of Faith or Baptist sixteen eighty nine. You know. We wouldn't bring those that we would say, right? What does Ephesians 1 say? Or things like that. You know, that would be the emphasis, um, if that makes sense. There's no great divide in terms of Calvinist and Arminian. I don't think, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that is very helpful. And I think, again, people would be probably saying, yeah, that sounds very familiar. And uh, I, I would say that this is for people who I am, I know the kind of conversations we have online when it comes to being into the history and stuff like that, it's easy to get caught up in the different names, the different movements and theological discussion. And I personally think it's great to have those discussions, but it's a time and a place kind of thing. So I would, I would appreciate where uh, you're hanging out with uh, your assembly and it, it really does become a bother. And it sounds like getting the gospel out. And that will be my last question in a second here. But those things can easily become a needless divide or distraction when if it's your emphasis, just let's get the gospel out in every opportunity. Some of those things, while important, might uh, prove a distraction. But again, differences, disagreements, we can have that con- kind of conversation, how important those things are. But for now, we're we're hearing, and I think you explained it well, your your take on it and what's going on in uh, the Brethren, or at least the Open Brethren Gospel Halls right now. So the last question, or maybe an invitation to speak on it, you mentioned several times now that the gospel is just getting it out there. And I think every Christian, hopefully out there would affirm, yes, we want to get the gospel out there. We want to be obedient to Christ's command and go to all the nations and uh, make disciples. And it sounds like for the brethren, though, that's like front and center in a way that might be uh, foreign to a lot of other Christian groups or a lot of other Christian movements where, of course, everyone's about the gospel, but we could be about the gospel with a a different sense of how do we approach it? How do we spread it? But I know from speaking with you, at least in your context, that getting the gospel out there doesn't just mean hosting meetings, but I know you also go out into your town and share the gospel. And that's something other traditions would do, but maybe you could just share my audience again, mostly Canada, North America, maybe they would uh, be interested to hear what, what is that like evangelizing in Scotland and uh, how do people receive that? Or do the people in your town, Oh, there, there come the brethren again. Like, what's that like? So, yeah, it's very interesting. A lot, as you were saying that, I'm just thinking how many things, how many meetings and how many you know, get-togethers are focused on the gospel. Mm. So we would have open airs, which someone has like a megaphone or a speaker mm. and a microphone. And we have started, again, started back because of COVID, we weren't allowed to, going out into the street, going out into roundabout our gospel hall just before the gospel meeting. Mm-hmm. And we invite people to come in and we leave them with a short gospel message, which 
must be the most peculiar thing to like non-Christians, you know, that peer through the blinds, obviously when it's good weather, you know, there's no point in the rain. Right. Peer through the blinds, their windows are open, it's a nice day, and they're like, here's six men in suits, or sort of formally dressed, and, you know, they've got, they're a speaker telling us about sin, <laughs> and the cross, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and our responsibility, and our need of a saviour, and, you know, things like that. But also, it's not like there are huge campaigns. Um, again, the Northern Irish kind of put Scotland to shame mm. when they have tent meetings, when they have gospel outreaches. Ours, a two week is a long stretch. They all have like 10 weeks, 12 oh. weeks. Um, but yeah, there's so much. Again, not going into all of it, but like tracking, which is like gospel leaflets. If there's going to be, say, a village doesn't have a gospel hall or doesn't even have a church. Um, there are organisations I help um, around Ayrshire, Dumfries and Galloway, Wildly Moor. Um, you know, someone goes and books a community hall and they will have gospel meetings for two weeks. Mm. Uh, but before that, we give out invitations uh, or like gospel literature or Bibles. And we go around the entire settlement putting these through letterboxes. Or if you're more courageous, you'll chap in the door. And he'll say, you know, do you know God? Or do you have a minute to talk about God? Um, or who are you going after you die? Do you have confidence? And things like that. Um, but there's so much in terms of gospel. There's like Sunday schools. There's coffee mornings. There's, again, literature distribution. Um, mm -hmm. I go every Friday to a town, about four or five minutes uh, south. And just offer free Bibles. We have open air, maybe 10 minutes of speaking, and people will just come up because th they, these, you know, so diverse, will never come into the walls of a church or a gospel hall. Will never, right? Right. Buddhists, atheists, uh, Satanists, and just young children, you, you know, obviously by the grace of God, you want them to come in, but, you know, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, means going out and it's very active, um, which again is not really sacrifice to us. We should see it as an honor. I was reading a book recently, it was um, a quote by David Livingston it says, if an earthly king gives us a commission, we consider it a great honor. You don't think about it, you just do it. How much more, like we should never consider the commission of our heavenly king to be sacrificed. It's such an honor. Like we're not worthy of preaching the gospel but we're given so many opportunities to just go because I think the urgency and the idea of eternity is such a high, again, this will be like common ground for a lot of Baptists or like more, I suppose, it would be fundamentalists or conservative uh, right. tags of just, we need to preach the gospel and there are people around us going to hell, going to a lost eternity on the broad road. We need to go. Like, mm. what are we doing right now that's stopping us? Is that more important? Probably not, you know. So we should, like, a lot of people look at gospel halls and they're like, oh, yeah, full of meetings and they're just always doing stuff. And you're like, well, that's what Christian life should be, you know. Um, mm. Oh, there's a full-time worker. Their full-time job is going from door to door. Like, yeah. <laughs> Someone do it. If they're called to do that, right. we do it, you know fulfilled what god has called you to do mm. um, but again just before i finish on that while a lot of emphasis is on the gospel a lot of emphasis beforehand is and after probably during is on prayer mm. um, so the lord's supper is prayer before the gospel meeting before we go out into an open air we pray before um handing out bibles we pray um, when we assemble together pray um constantly because you know, we're aware and you are aware we can't do it in our own strength we can't it's not what we say god's word and if we lift up the cross we lift up christ that that's what draws people um, mm. rather than you know so that has to be by prayer has to be um it was very annoying during lockdown we couldn't go and pray so annoying um and Zoom prayer meetings just aren't, just don't quite cut it. 
Um, yeah, yeah. As you'll probably know. But yeah. yeah. The gospel but also has to be very much by prayer and living out. Um, gospel hall should be a one body like a family rather than clocking in and clocking out of a church or, you know, or going to a large church where the pastor or the minister doesn't know your name or something. You know, it should be a living, breathing body which has an eye on Christ, but also wanting to go out and share the good news of the gospel rather than worrying about Calvinism or Arminianism, you know, like at right. um, the end of the day, both Calvinists and Arminians will preach the gospel and rely on God. And not that we don't sit and do ministry. A lot of it is biblical based. We have Bible teaching and Bible ministry. But again, gospel hall, you know, the gospel has to be the focus um, or our denomination, if you call it that. We also, um, and I've said also but three times here, but also yes. um, missionaries have been a huge part of um, Brethren and Gospel Halls have been for years. Um, very common for God to call someone, to, you know, a famous example, Jim Elliott and Nate Saint to right. um, South America. Mm -hmm. um, and India has a huge population of bread, open brethren due to the fact of missionaries and a lot of Gospel Halls will set money aside to gift just missionaries, not necessarily even just brethren or brethren associated missions, just God's people needing help. Because if we can give, we should. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we feel. Um, but yeah, I'll stop rambling. I'll, you know, <laughs> no, but... a lot to, I'll, I'll let your listener or uh, watcher, viewers um, uh, dissect that on their own time. But yeah. Yeah, no, that, but Tom, that was fantastic. And I'm glad you mentioned Jim Elliott. People know that name and know his story. And it's just amazing. I didn't know that he was brethren. So that that's great to I hear. So I looked that up recently. So yeah. if I'm wrong, I do apologize. Oh, okay. yeah, I, I just assume. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but that, that's, it doesn't sound wrong to me. So yeah, we can, we can double check that later or people on their own time. But uh, I, I really, have to just emphasize a couple things there where, uh, first of all, for my audience, and I, I'm sharing this with you, Tom, you might be aware, we, we hear stories of what goes on in Western Europe now, and we're thinking, oh, man, that is like, it's it's lost, and we need to send missionaries back there, which I think is true for Western Europe, by and large, but it's amazing to hear and so encouraging to hear that there will still be assemblies like your own just hit, hitting the streets door by door and in, in the public square. So I think that's an encouragement here where you get some people doing that here, but that's more, as you said, that that would be more of like, oh, that's the fundamentalist church in town. And while we, we don't have a problem with that, that wouldn't be our way of doing things. But I think hearing that, I think a lot of people right now, if they're listening closely and if they're a believer listening, would have a healthy dose of conviction of uh, what you yeah, mentioned like, with that. I often get quote. cute. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people say, oh, you know, gospels or you take Christianity very seriously, don't you? Mm. And you don't, you know, like, right, it, right. You know, it should be God first, yourself last, and others in between. You know, it should be all these wee ditties and words like that. You know, it should be service mm. to God, yeah. full um, consecration right. um, to God. Yeah. And, and um, which that... is very difficult. Yeah. Just to say, I'm yeah. not sitting here chapping doors seven days, six days a week. Right. Um, right. You know, that's what it should be. Um, yeah. is what I emphasize. I'm, I'm in no particular place to be the standard or um, it's just, yeah, I know. And a lot of Christians will know how to share the gospel. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think what, what, whatever that looks like for people, I think the, the important takeaway here is having that there, there should be a zeal for Christ and an excitement. And if we don't have that and there's a reality of life or ups and downs, but praying for that passion and for that uh just that drive to be excited for our commission where i, I love that you mentioned that where it, it can feel like a, a daunting chore at times just to invite a friend out to church or to have a gospel conversation but that that's our great privilege to be it, it's like and i was thinking of the example of when an ambassador is named by a country that's not like oh they named me the ambassador to like 
Britain or somewhere like that. No, you're excited. Yeah. That's a celebration. That's that's good news. So uh, how much more for Christians and the great king that we're that we're serving under. And the the yeah. other thing that I, I just want to mention, and then we'll we'll wrap it up here is as you were speaking, it was just uh, and you were saying all that, imagining, wow, they like the the open brethren in Scotland are just like they're they're getting stuff done they're doing work but now i can't help but imagine what is going on in northern ireland they must be if you're saying yeah. they put scotland to shame they must be really yeah. killing it out there but uh that yeah. that that again as a couple of historian history kind of guys i think that really speaks to we know well i think a lot of people here know of uh the incredibly wild and oftentimes violent history of uh, Ireland and religious history and all the different things that happen there. But I think it speaks to how like different cultures just in, take on different uh, passions and take on different things where we, we can imagine we know some some people groups for some reason, they just really get on mission in all sorts of incredible ways. And God works as God works. And that's ultimately up to him. But I think that's encouraging for people as we think about global Christianity. And now we get to hear it from you that, uh, that we, we can't say, oh, they're, they're totally lost out there. No, there are communities that are still there. And we should think of ways to support them. And I think primarily that would be pray for our brothers and sisters in Scotland and Northern Ireland and the cross Western Europe, as we hear the stories and declining numbers, closing churches, there are people out there who need prayer as God uses them. So Tom, thank you for sharing all that. And we, I'm sure there's so much more we can get into, but uh, maybe we'll close it up now and something that I typically do with my guests and uh, maybe you're familiar or maybe not, but I'll invite my guests to share a final encouragement or a final reflection for my audience. It could be whatever. It doesn't have to be related to the brethren or the gospel hall, but it could be, but anything you have on your mind that you just want to leave with us now, and then uh, we can close it from there. Yeah, so I wasn't expecting this. So I'll just pluck something which just came up and it's been on my mind. Yeah. You know, it's very important to look in the West. And I don't want you thinking there's huge amounts of gospel halls in Scotland, Northern Ireland. Right. Um, you know, there is declining like so many branches of the universal church just seems as if it's diminishing. Mm. But not to be discouraged for that. But the thing I want to take away is not to keep the emphasis on a global level or even a national level. Um, so much of Christian today, Christianity today, um, because of Zoom, because of online, because of social media, we're concerned with preacher so-and-so from Minnesota, North Carolina, or mm. um, just to really, who is your neighbor going to heaven or hell? As the person across the street, do they know the gospel? Do they love the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, that should be the emphasis. And gospel halls have always been local and just rooted into there's such a good thing about testimony and witness, you know, living out um, God's teaching, living out Christ likeness, holiness, isn't going to affect someone across the pond, isn't going to affect someone in another continent but your neighbor needs to see it the poor widow the down and out needs to see that um we need to be more engaged with local levels because again if your if your church is declining a, a family across the continent's not going to bolster the numbers not just about numbers but when we look to god and trust god um you know we had a family read their bible and came along to save out with gospel meetings you know god is powerful and god can work but our eye should be on local levels and just caring for the souls of our neighbors to love our neighbors you know it's right there how many times is it in the new testament in the old testament love their neighbors and yet we fail and yet we're sitting here cooking up excuses or sitting in your comfy sofa bed and be like yeah, you know, that zeal actually make, you know, force yourself, discipline yourself, whatever, put your foot at your front door and tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ would be my encouragement and encouragement to myself as well, because I'm guilty of it. It's so comfortable. Why is the West declining? Why is the church declining? Because we're not just leaving our front door and telling others, 
you know, that's why we like to read about it. We like to read about the Reformation. We like to read about church history. All these people standing in a field and we don't do it ourselves. It's not a substitute, you know. Um, maybe going on too long, but just that zeal put it into action. Get stuck in to your local assembly. Get stuck into the gospel and just really rely on God to give you strength, to give you grace, to just tell others about Christ. Because at the end of the day, what does anything else matter? You know, we could stand before Christ and we want to hear that well done, the faithful servant, not shying away or well, they, they turned up to church or yeah, they're giving out teas and coffees. You know, soul, there are souls to be saved. That's my final encouragement, I think. Um, that that's amazing. You're getting a massive amen from me. And that's, <laughs> that's a message I needed to hear as well. And I think a lot of people in our age of Twitter and uh, uh, casting and streaming that that's an encouragement. I think we all need to take in and I think I'm very glad you said it. So I, I I'm going to work on that. And I, I wouldn't jump on that encouragement to everyone. Please take that seriously. Think about that, pray about that and look, look into your local church and see what you could be doing and your neighbors, of course. So Tom, thank you so much for coming on. I think everyone learned a lot. And if they have questions, I will encourage them. Tom and I, we will be talking some more. We, we chit chat quite a bit. So if you have questions or are looking for any sort of resource or anything like that, please leave a comment down below. Tom, I'll, I'll make sure that you see whatever questions or comments come, whether it's on YouTube or Discord, of course, and different places like that. But uh, again, yeah. thanks, Tom. I hope everyone, you, you've you appreciated that. This is my first, uh, I, I would say foreign, but Canada, I had Americans on, but first intercontinental interview. So yeah. <laughs> Tom, that uh, it's not that big of an honor, but yeah, oh, I'm, I'm taking it as a huge honor. Yeah, <laughs> okay. thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So everyone, there you have it. Thanks for tuning in this week. I hope I can see you all again. Take care.